Now, this is towards the center of the Milky Way galaxy. You see the milky whiteness. That's not clouds. That's millions and millions and billions of stars. Uh, and that dark lane through the center and that bulge towards the bottom, those are dust clouds blocking the light uh, the, so we can't see into the center very easily in the visible light spectrum. And if you look off to the left, you'll see a little line. This is a about a 15 second exposure, 10 second exposure. And uh, uh, that little line is a satellite that zipped across the sky. Actually not zip because meteorites zip, satellites kind of move slow and steady. And so uh, when you see little lines in night sky photography, or if you're looking up the sky, it's either a meteor or it uh, could be a, a satellite. You see a lot more satellites these days than when I was a kid. So Carolyn, if you'll let me back. Okay, so let's go on. So, uh, oh, I have some photos in here for you. Uh, uh, in the lower right is the Hubble Space Telescope. That is a reflecting telescope. You can see that there's no lens in the front. On the left is the 60-inch uh, reflecting telescope at Mount Wilson. Uh, it's an amazing thing. Uh, you would barely, uh, a human being would stand, oh, about as high as that blue tube at the bottom. So uh, it's an amazing instrument, and uh, it's over 100 years old, and many advances in science by this 60-inch telescope, as well as the 100-inch up at Mount Wilson. Uh, and then you'll see a little diagram in the upper right to show you the light path of a reflecting telescope. That's a mirror-based telescope. So we're now going to go on to number four, uh, constellations and stars. So, uh, you know, we're going to talk about distances and a few things like that. So I want to just go over a couple things with you. Um, you know, we talk about the speed of light. Um, you know, 100 years ago, or actually more like 150 years ago, nobody thought that light had a speed. They thought it was instantaneous, but in fact, they developed these instruments that bounce that light back and forth and figured out how to time it. And you can't use a clock. There's no clock in the world that could possibly measure the speed of light. So they developed these really amazing uh, instruments that have these fan wheels that are offset and they spin them. And the only way the light can make it through uh, would be to measure the, the speed. So that's uh, 670 million miles per hour. Uh, so in an hour, you're, uh, you know, way out uh, to the nearest planets past Jupiter. Uh, and I usually think of it in miles per second. It's 186,000 miles per second or multiple times around the Earth in one second. Uh, if you like kilometers, it's 299,000 kilometers per second. So how far is the Earth from the Sun? Uh, 94 million miles. Uh, so we call that the, the average distance of the Earth from the Sun one astronomical unit. Uh, and so we measure distances out from the solar system. A lot of times, if you're two astronomical units from the Sun, you're twice the distance from the Sun as the Earth is. So just so you'll know, the planet Jupiter, which you'll see tonight, it's a beautiful view, uh, is 480 million miles away which is a little less than one light hour. Uh, and uh, that's 5.2 AUs. So if you're traveling from the sun, it's five times further to Jupiter than the Earth. And Saturn is even further still. Saturn's really far away. When you get out to Neptune, and like you're really far away. Like even if you had a radio or a cell phone, you would have to wait uh, uh, you know, almost an hour uh, each direction just to say hello to someone on Jupiter. So when we're controlling those satellites that are, uh, you know, the probes and the inter interplanetary uh, instruments that we've been sending out, like they, they can't communicate with those in real time. They have to send the instructions ahead of time because it takes half an hour or an hour or even longer. We had uh, uh, the, the one that went to Pluto uh, you can imagine, like, uh, sending a message or instruction to that uh, uh, instrument, I think, took several hours. So you don't get anything in real time when you're that far from the sun. Uh, the Milky Way galaxy. So let's, let's talk a little bit about the night sky. The stars slowly circle overhead. And we've already answered this question. You should understand it. 
that it's not the sky that's spinning, it's us. We're standing on a rotating ball and uh, every 24 hours it makes a complete circle. So if you stood in one place and it was dark, the stars would circle around the pole star. Uh, that is the point in the sky that the North Pole points at, uh, which is Polaris, uh, which you should be able to find using uh, the, the pointer stars in the Big Dipper. A constellation is a group of stars in the sky. Uh, and that's just what the word means. Con means uh, uh, together or with, and stellar means star. So it's just a group of stars. And we just group them together in their areas by their shape. And there's no, you know, whatever they happen to look like. Uh, different cultures have different names for these shapes in the sky. And we've inherited the ones that came down to us through ancient Greece, which goes all the way back to Babylon. And we still measure things in the sky by degrees and minutes. Uh, which is the old Babylonian mass system. So the system that we use and the constellations that we see go, uh, go back thousands of years to uh, uh, early history. Um, so, and they have names, you know, the constellations in the sky, you'll see them on your sky map. Uh, but it's just the appearance, they, 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 the stars in the sky that are in a particular constellation, they're just in a region of the sky, but that doesn't mean they're close together. Some of them could be really close to us, like a, you know, maybe, uh, 10, 20, 30, 40 light years, and some other stars in that constellation might be really far away. Um, people didn't know that stars were at different distances, uh, uh, but we know that now. But they still look like Scorpio is a picture of, uh, you know, the uh, scorpion. So that's what people saw when they saw that one. Uh, the Milky Way galaxy, a giant wheel of stars that, uh, you know, wasn't until uh, some uh, researchers up uh, in uh, Lick Observatory and some in England and even some here in California uh, figured out you know what the shape of our galaxy is by measuring the distances to stars. By the way measuring distances to stars is an amazing and difficult thing to do but they figured out how to do it by measuring the angle at different times of the year to the star. So if you'll notice if you close one eye and then close the other one and open and switch back and forth you'll see that the view that you're looking just shifts a little bit. That's called parallax from two different viewpoints. And they use that like the base of a triangle to measure the distances to stars. And that and some other methods uh, allowed them to figure out the shape of our galaxy, a giant spiral wheel. And we're in the middle of it off to the, uh, off to the center a little bit. So back to our... Uh, So constellations and stars, uh, A, identify at least 10 constellations, at least four of which are in the zodiac. Um, so I have, I've listed some on the screen here for you. I will get you a download for this, or if you want me to just email you the deck, email Carolyn and we'll send you the deck. I picked ones that, have, that are invisible in our sky, mostly this time of year, not all of them. But uh, these all have big bright stars in them, some of which you'll be able to see tonight. So if you get out your star map, uh, we'll go over them real quick and uh, you can make some notes. So Ursa Minor is where Polaris is at the center. So that's gonna be in the north central part and it's gonna be at the end of the handle of the Little Dipper. Uh, and that's the pole star. So I want you to have Ursa Minor as one of your constellations. You're not gonna be able to see the Little Dipper because the night the, the light pollution washes it out in LA. But you should be able to see Polaris if you have a good view to the north and there's not like a bright street light. Um, so Polaris in Ursa Minor is a really good one. Uh, Ursa Major uh, is the Big Dipper, which you should be able to see in the city for the most part. And if you look at the two outer stars of the cup, they point directly at Polaris. It's a way that you can find uh, Polaris from the Big Dipper. And uh, Mizar is a double star. It's the middle star in the handle. It is marked on your star map. So uh, you can get a star in Ursa Major and get one of your stars that way. Uh, uh, Boots is got the, the bright star Arcturus in it. And that's right near, uh, directly overhead to the right of Hercules. Uh, the, I don't know if it's Boots or Boats. I've heard it both ways. But there's a really bright red giant, which is visible to the naked eye in LA. That star is called Arcturus, and it's up in the summertime. You may well be able to see it tonight if you can get oriented right. If you see a bright star in that direction, it's almost certainly Arcturus. You probably will not see the other stars in that constellation 
unless you have a really dark backyard and, and the sky is clear. Uh, Lyra in Vega, uh, you will certainly see tonight. Um, that is to the left of Hercules, almost directly overhead to the right, to the, to the right of Cygnus. It's a little tiny one, uh, but Vega is a magnitude zero star and you're supposed to put the magnitude down. It's in your scout book. Um, I didn't put it in the slide for some reason. Uh, Vega is actually the measure star for what magnitude zero is. It's like the brightest star in the northern sky. So if there's any star you can see tonight, Vega is the one. It's going to be nearly overhead, uh, and it's going to be a bright white star uh, off to the left or towards the east a little bit. Um, so Cygnus is the next constellation over in the middle of the Milky Way. Uh, this one's going to be a little fainter here in the city, but you might catch it. It's that big cross shape on your star map uh, with Deneb at the base. Cygnus is uh, the goose and uh, the wings, and Cygnus is swan, thank you, uh, some bird. And uh, it's flying through the Milky Way. Uh, so if you can see uh, Cygnus and the bright star Deneb to the left or towards the east of Vega, um, that you know you're looking at the Milky Way. Uh, so Aquila Altair is going to complete our summer triangle uh, to the southeast of uh, Vega in Lyra and Deneb in Cygnus to the left of Hercules. This is going to be the left center of your map in the Milky Way is Altair the Eagle uh, or Aquila the Eagle. The bright star in this one is Altair. This is another magnitude uh, one star. So those four stars, Vega, Deneb, and Altair, very likely you'll be able to see all three of those tonight. Uh, and you'll be able to, we call those the summer triangle because they're bright stars and we often uh, see them. So I listed a few others here. Uh, Gemini is not visible tonight, but it's a two bright stars, Castor and Pollux, uh, not in the sky tonight, but Gemini is in the zodiac or in the ecliptic. So that's a good one. Leo is off there to the right. Uh, so you might see Regulus in the west for Leo. Uh, Virgo is Spica. Again, this is, when I say on the ecliptic, I mean along that dotted line and towards the, the west or right of your star map. So Regulus in Leo and Spica in Virgo are bright stars for your thing. The last one I point out tonight is if you have a good view to the south and it's kind of dark, you will definitely see due south, you'll see Scorpius, which is another... Uh, Zodiac, ecliptic-based uh, constellation, uh, Scorpius the Scorpion. And the star I want you to look for is Antares, which is a very large red star. And when I say red, I mean it's kind of orangish. Uh, but what we say is that the uh, uh, Antares is the beating heart of the Scorpion because it's a, a red giant in, in, and it's very visible to the naked eye. It's another magnitude one star. And it's towards the center of the Milky Way galaxy. There's a whole bunch of stuff over there. Uh, on to the left is going to be uh, Sagittarius, the teapot, and that's right towards the direction of the center of the Milky Way galaxy. I didn't list it, but you can if you want. So uh, there uh, is a list of constellations for you that, that when we take our break and you go outside, you can try and find some. Because of the light pollution in the city, I don't expect you to be able to see all of these. Uh, what we're really looking here for is your best effort. When you come back, if you think you saw Vega, type Vega into the chat. I want to see uh, who can see anything. If anyone sees Jupiter, I want them to type Jupiter in the chat. And let's see, as a group, uh, how many of these things we can find on our star map. So that's uh, A and B uh, in this one slide. So I hope you're taking notes. If you don't take notes, this is in your merit badge booklet. Or we went over our star map, right? So you can get the same information off your star map. Again, the constellation is what I listed in the slide and in parentheses is the bright magnitude one star uh, that you can see in that constellation. So some of these are, a Vega is a zero and a couple of these are not quite ones, but these are all the brightest stars in these constellations. So they're perfectly good answers. If you can find even one of them tonight, uh, you'll be doing a good job. If you can come up with two or three, you're doing great in the city. Uh, and use your map, your star map, and do get oriented. If you're not sure which direction north is, um, get your compass, ask a parent, find Polaris. The way I do it is I know that the mountains behind Pasadena are to the north of us. So if you know where the mountains are, 
turn your back to the mountains and you're facing south, and then near the horizon, you should see Scorpius and the red giant Antares. So if someone gets Antares, I'll give you a, a bonus points for that. Okay, so that's 4A and 4B. Uh, 4C is gonna be the Big Dipper sketches. And obviously, uh, when you go out uh, and you sketch the Big Dipper, you could do it tonight. If you can find the Big Dipper, uh, you can do this tonight, uh, or you can do it tomorrow night. Uh, obviously, you write down the date and time, and you go out, what is it, an hour later? Uh, yeah, go out an hour or two later, and then look again, and you'll see that it's in a slightly different position. Sketch that, and then think in your mind, oh, the sky is rotating around Polaris, and so the Big Dipper makes a circle around, and every hour it moves 1 24th around, right? Okay. So you do need to do 4C on your own. Uh, sketch the Big Dipper tonight or tomorrow night. Um, you know, uh, if you uh, can't stay up late to do astronomy because you have something to do in the morning, that's okay. You can work on it tomorrow night and send me the completed packet. Hopefully, yeah, or this weekend. Maybe you already did it. Some of you already did it. Okay, so we explained what we look at when we looked at the Milky Way. Uh, it's the galaxy we live in. Uh, it's a disc-shaped spiral, uh, barred spiral. Uh, and it has literally billions and billions of stars. Uh, I think I wrote it down. It's 100,000 light years across. It's only 1,000 light years thick on average, although it's a lot thicker in that bulge in the center. Uh, what you think about it is a very large, thin disk of spiraling stars. Uh, the Milky Way is about 13 billion years old based on the most current science. Uh, and we don't know exactly how many stars there are. The estimates have been getting better. The estimates range from 200 to 400 or even upwards of 500 billion stars. They're still figuring this out. Maybe you guys will go on to a career and you'll be able to figure some of this stuff out. This is intimately tied to the mysteries of dark matter and galactic rotation and cosmology. But a good estimate's around 300 billion suns. And that's just in the one galaxy. That's our galaxy. Uh, it's hard to imagine that there are millions and millions and millions of galaxies, uh, each of which has billions and billions of stars. It's a, it's a truly astounding thing uh, to think about. Uh, okay, so that's about our Milky Way galaxy. Uh, it gets us through 4D, five planets. Uh, you list the names of the five most visible planets. I'm putting a slide up here. As you well know, that is not to scale. That's just to show you the relative order of the planets. There are uh, four inner planets. Uh, Earth is one of them, but we're not gonna list that because you live on that one and you don't look at the sky to see that one. So Mercury and Venus are inner planets that are inside the orbit of the Earth. So starting on the inside out, it goes Mercury, Venus, then Earth, Mars, and that's the inner rocky planets. Uh, then the asteroid belt, maybe there was a planet there, but Jupiter kind of cracked it up. Um, and that's where all the asteroids live. Uh, and then the great planet Jupiter, the giant of our solar system that shapes pretty much how our solar, solar system works. <coughs> I think at latest, I, I don't remember the exact count, but I think it's over 70 moons of Jupiter. And Jupiter has uh, some rings and it's a gas giant. It has a huge magnetic field. And it's one of the most active areas of research in trying to understand. Uh, Jupiter is not big enough for gravity to crush it into a star. If it were, you know, 10 times bigger than it were, I think that would be about enough matter to create enough gravity to crush the hydrogen together and light fusion. So Jupiter's not quite a mini star because it's not quite big enough, but it's way bigger than the Earth. Uh, and you, it has no surface. There's no place to stand on Jupiter. It's mostly just gas uh, and uh, compressed uh, fluids in various layers. It has a very active weather system, convection and spinning, and even through a small telescope like mine, you can see many features through your telescope of the planet Jupiter, which you will see tonight when we take our break. So Venus, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Mercury, uh, and all of these are in a rotating disk, which we call the ecliptic, in a line through the sky. So if you see the moon uh, and Jupiter, you know, that's the line. And every other planet is going to be somewhere on that line, uh, if not, you know, on the other side of the Earth. 
but that's how that works. The outer planets, Jupiter and Saturn, these are the five visible planets. Uh, uh, Uranus and Neptune are not visible to the naked eye. You need a telescope. You can see them in my telescope. They're pretty tiny and hard to find, but Neptune especially is a beautiful color. Uh, and uh, planets are unlike stars. So when you're looking at a planet, you know, in binoculars or with your eye, how do you tell it's a planet and not a star? And there actually is a trick to it. Planets are actually tiny little disks and stars are points. So when the upper atmosphere moves around, it pushes the light of stars around and makes them twinkle. Uh, but planets don't twinkle. So if you're looking at a, a bright light in the sky, that's not a plane or a satellite, it's not moving and it's not twinkling, it's probably a planet. Uh, if it's twinkling, it's probably a star. Uh, and if it's blinking on and off, it's probably a plane. But if it's a star blinking on and off, that's really important. So <laughs> make note. Uh, so uh, which planets have phases? So the moon has phases. Sometimes it's on one side of the earth, sometimes it's on the other side of the earth, and we see a quarter moon or a half moon or a three quarter moon, and you gotta scope all that out. When we look in towards the sun at Mercury and Venus, sometimes Mercury and Venus are on one side of the sun, sometimes they're on the other side of the sun. So actually, Mercury and Venus, when looked through telescopes, have phases. So you can see a half Venus, quarter Venus, three quarters. If you're looking at the outer planets, Mars, Jupiter, you know, out away from us, uh, then, uh, then that doesn't happen because you're always looking at the full face of the planet reflected by the sunlight. So only Venus and Mercury have phases. And the reason is because they're in towards the sun. They're close to the sun. Whereas to look at Mars, you have to look outward and uh, you're not going to see a, a, a half Mars or a quarter Mars. Uh, and certainly not Jupiter and Saturn. All right, here is a, another picture. This is a pretty good one. Uh, so that's a AU scale. And you see it's a logarithmic scale, so it's getting much bigger. So uh, Saturn is out there at 10 AU, and Pluto is out at 65 AU, and then you get out into the Kuiper belt and beyond. The edge of the solar system is, they're not absolutely sure. Uh, I think uh, Voyager spacecraft are out around 125 AU, uh, well past uh, uh, the orbit of Pluto, uh, but they're just now crossing the very edge of our solar system, and people are uh, arguing about that. Uh, so there's your planets and the asteroid belt and the distance. Okay, so uh, this is a chart I made for you guys on uh, what's visible this year because I think that's 5B. Um, you can get this from a, a website or a magazine or, uh, you know, in the logistics document, I sent you a, a link to the uh, a night sky map that'll show you each month what planets are visible in the night sky. Uh, I'll leave this slide up for a second uh, while we describe C and D because you may want to copy down uh, what planets are visible on what months. If you don't get it copied down, uh, I just want you to think about why this is. Like, you know, if we're on the other side of the sun and Mars is behind the sun, then you can't see it at night. So for half the year, you basically can't see Mars. Uh, and that's true of all the planets. They're visible at different times and different days, and they follow different patterns. So it's probably best to have a chart and know where the planets are. The inner planets move kind of quickly. You can see them move across the night sky from night to night, or you know, more month to month. Uh, they don't move that fast. Uh, but you know, planets like Jupiter and and uh, uh, Saturn, you know, they take more than a human lifetime to go around the sun. So you're not going to see them move much. Uh, okay, so describe the motions of the planets across the sky. So the motions, the, the planets move relative to the stars, right? <clears throat> the fixed stars just stay right where they are and rotate around with the night sky, but the stars are called the fixed stars because they're always in the same position relative to each other. But stars, uh, planets drift across the constellation pattern as the planets go through their orbits. And when the Earth you know, passes an orbit from the inside, like on a racetrack, you pass by a planet, uh, the motion actually gets a little weird. It goes this way to the left, then it goes back to the right, and then it goes back to the left again. And that's the Earth moving around on the inside track and the relative motion of the planets. 
so describe the motion of the planets. It's linear across the sky in epicycles, and that's covered in your merit badge book. Uh, and the epicycle is where it moves to the right and then to the left and then back to the right. Uh, and on D, uh, you're going to be able to see Jupiter tonight. Uh, if you follow my instructions, it's going to be kind of low on the horizon. Uh, so good luck. Uh, it's going to be off to the south, southeast. Uh, and a uh, little more to the east. It's marked clearly on your star map. So if you get oriented, uh, you should be able to see Jupiter. And it's very, very, very bright. It's not a star. Um, so uh, it is on the ecliptic. And you can write down uh, what you saw. If you have super good eyes, maybe you could see some of the moons of Jupiter. But I think actually you need a telescope for that. Okay, so Mercury and Venus aren't visible very often because they're so close to the sun. Uh, Mars is visible about half the year until it swings around. And right now, uh, Venus, excuse me, Jupiter and Saturn are on the correct side of the sun for us facing out at night. So you can see Jupiter and Saturn. I hope you get to see Jupiter tonight. All right, so I'm gonna move on. If you need, uh, uh, you can go to the recording if we have that or the slide deck, or you can go research it yourself what planets are visible to finish your worksheet. So C, we described the motion of the planets. D, you're gonna observe uh, Jupiter tonight or any night that you can. Uh, number six is sketch, sketch the face of the moon and mark the seas and craters. That's one of your prereqs. There's a map of moon in your merit badge book or you can use an online map. Uh, sketch the phases. You'll find lots of diagrams. I have one in the slide thing. Uh, it shows how the phases of the moon work. That's with the sunlight coming in from the right and how a new moon and a full moon works. Full moon is when the, the moon is on the far side of the earth relative to the sun, and that way it illuminates the whole disk. A new moon is when uh, the moon is between us and earth, and that way we're looking at the dark side so we don't see anything. Uh, and obviously a half moon is when it's to either side, and then the crescents uh, waxing and waning, uh, quarter, half, and uh, waxing gibbous. So and it goes through that cycle every 31 days. Uh, or is it, no, it's 21, 29 and a half days. And so the lunar cycle and the months don't quite match up, but close. One lunar cycle from new moon to new moon or full moon to full moon is all, almost exactly one month. And so that means that the, sky, the, the moon moves fairly dramatically each day. If you come back one day later, uh, the moon's going to be in like a three hand difference in the sky in a different position because it goes completely around the earth in just 29 days. So the moon moves fairly dramatically. So you will do the daily position of your moon for four days in a row. Now the moon is currently rising at two and it's up in the morning. So if you wanna get up real early in the morning and do your moon sketches, that's a perfectly great way to do it. Um, as I, you know, if you wanna sketch Jupiter uh, instead of the moon uh, for four nights in a row, since that's a good time of night right now, feel free to do that. You're not gonna get quite the same movement. So do it at different times. Uh, on four nights and attract the motion of Jupiter a little bit. Um, but uh, to do the moon right now, you would have to be getting up very early in the morning or staying up very late. Uh, in, in 15 days, uh, the moon will be rising in the night again. So you, you could wait that long if you wanted to. Uh, but yeah, make, make some sketches. Uh, and if you wanna substitute Jupiter to get your packet done, um, that's fine. Uh, just do Jupiter four nights in a row and give me some different times to show the motion. Uh, but if you're going to do uh, the moon, uh, you're going to have to get up pretty early in the morning unless you want to wait a couple weeks. Okay, so moving on. Uh, 6C, uh, list the factors that keep the moon in orbit. Uh, this one's pretty easy. I'm, most of you probably have some idea of the two balanced forces that keep the moon from either crashing into the earth or flying out into outer space. Obviously that has to be a really carefully balanced uh, set of forces. Uh, if the gravitational pull of the earth were stronger, the, earth, the moon would be pulled into the earth, it would crash into the earth and there would be total destruction. Um, so what force counteracts the gravity that pulls the earth and moon together? Well, they're spinning around each other. So just like skaters holding hands going around in a circle, there's a, a linear centrifugal force uh, that tries to pull 
since the moon is going really, 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 really fast, uh, if you canceled the effect of gravity, it would fly in a straight line straight off into outer space. So that, that spinning radial velocity is a outward force, you know, like if you're on a merry-go-round or you're spinning in a circle, you can kind of feel uh, that, that force wants to push you away uh, off, you know, in another direction. So what keeps the earth and more around this? It's the motion of the moon balancing with the gravity of the earth in, in a perfect balance to keep it right where it is, going around and around in circles. Uh, and then the relative position of the phases, uh, based on the diagram I've given you or the one in your scout book, you should be able to fill in 6D um, with what the phases of the moon are for each of those different positions of the moon and the sun. On um, the diagrams in the worksheet, the sunlight's coming from the sun on the left. So the diagram I have on the slide, the sunlight's coming from the right. But you could just picture which way the sunlight is coming from. So that's going to be the lit up side of the moon. Uh, OK. Seven is the last one we're going to do. Uh, and then we're going to take uh, a break. And then when we come back from break, we're going to do our live viewing. So number seven, the sun. Uh, describe the co composition of the sun, its relationship to other stars, and some effects on its radiation on Earth's weather. So composition, uh, it's almost all hydrogen with some helium, which is the byproduct of fusion. So the gravity of the sun squishes the hydrogen together, uh, heats it up, compresses it, gives it lots of energy. And if you can do that, it'll push two hydrogens together and make a helium. When that happens, it releases a large amount of energy. We call that energy sunlight. Eventually, it reaches the surface of the sun and shines out into space. Uh, you can crush helium into lithium and other uh, atomic elements. And bigger, bigger stars and explosions can eventually crush things into carbon and eventually iron and all the different elements. Those are all manufactured in, uh, in what amount to really giant stars or stellar explosions. But our sun is a kind of a run-of-the-mill yellow star. It's mostly hydrogen. It's essentially burning that hydrogen into helium to make sunlight. Uh, and it does have multiple layers and it has a big magnetic field and it is rotating. Um, but the composition is almost all helium. Uh, the relationship to other stars, uh, this is a mid-life star. It's still shining. It hasn't burned out. It's not a brown dwarf or a, uh, a quiet little red star that's kind of at the end of its life. Uh, it's not early in its life. It's not a newly made star. It's about uh, uh, an average middle of the, the road star for the Milky Way. The effects on Earth weather are primarily uh, the heat from sunlight powers the convection of our atmosphere and circulates air around. And that's where we get wind and weather and storms and rain and all that stuff. So uh, the sun's effect on our weather is 100%. If it weren't for the sun, there wouldn't be any weather. Uh, the effect on communications, every now and then the magnetic fields of the sun get twisted up and it sends out big magnetic storms of radiation uh, and it can knock out communication satellites or even radio uh, signals here on Earth. Uh, so uh, the sun is a very, very powerful uh, thing. It puts out huge amounts of radiation in all directions from the, uh, the inner fusion. Uh, so sunspots on 7B. Again, in your merit badge book, if you need to look up answers. Uh, but sunspots are essentially storms uh, that are rooted on the outer layers of the sun. They are caused, the sun has differential rotation. That means the equator uh, rotates faster than the uh, north and south uh, polar regions of the sun. And what happens is those magnetic lines get all twisted up and those sunspots are big magnetic storms uh, uh, and they're visible on the surface of, st of the sun if you have the right kind of uh, solar filter. They don't happen all the time. They come and go, kind of like, kind of like weather. Uh, and uh, every now and then one of those sunspots, you know, if the loops of radiation get tangled up and then a big arc is released out, you get these uh, bursts of radiation, uh, solar flares they're called. <laughs> and uh, they can definitely uh, increase uh, the solar radiation a lot temporarily. That will mess up your internet connection. That will mess up your internet connection. That's right, solar flares. Uh, 
identify at least one red star, one blue star, and one yellow star other than the sun. Uh, they're back in that slide uh, of the 10 stars we did. I'll give you Antares as your red star because I want you to see if you can see it tonight. Uh, and uh, I think Vega is going to be a blue star, uh, but you can check uh, your merit badge book or online to look up what kind of stars uh, are on your list. And the meaning of these colors, they're very significant. The meaning of these colors have to do with the composition, size, and temperature of the star. So we use color to determine what the, like, you know, 150 years ago, 100 to 150 years ago, nobody knew what stars were made of. They had no idea. I literally thought, well, it's a, a giant volcano or something. They just didn't know. Uh, but now we know through spectral analysis that color tells us what elements are being fused and uh, what stars are made out of. So modern science, uh, you know, with spectroscopy, we're able to figure that out. So the meaning of the colors is temperature, size, and composition. And that's why different color stars are very important. Uh, okay, so that leads us to number seven. So number eight, I'm gonna sign off on uh, because you are doing, uh, you're doing B, although our observing session is not going to be a full three hours. The whole class is three hours. We are going to be doing some observing with Spencer here in a little bit. Um, so at this point, let me see, let me check on the time. It's 8.37. So we're right about where we want to be. Um, I'm going to stay here for an extra minute or two in case you have a question. We're going to take about a 15 minute break uh, so you can use the restroom, uh, get a cold drink. But in this 15 minute break, I want you to get your star map, go outside, look at the sky, try to find one object. Look for the bright star Vega overhead or Jupiter or Antares near the southern horizon. Um, you're going to need to not be around a street light. Um, don't wander off, get lost, or trip in the dark. Be safe. But uh, we'll give points to everyone that comes back in, in about 15 minutes and has found at least one object. And if you can get two or three, that's uh, even better. Uh, at, uh, after our break, we're going to start our live viewing session with uh, Spencer Suhu, who is going to be not just demoing, he's actually got an astronomical digital camera connected to a really, really good telescope and he's gonna live view with us. So I'll see you guys in about, let's call it at nine o'clock, that'll get you extra time to take a break and go outside. So good luck in your viewing. Uh, remember for your packet, you're supposed to write down what you see. So uh, go see something and write it down. See you in 15 minutes. Extra Able to spot anything. If you had clouds or trees blocking your way, it's not your fault. You can always try another night. Uh, we did get some good viewing tonight, even for the city. So uh, congrats on the people that were able to see Jupiter. That's a great spot uh, and something that you can put in your notes uh, for your workbook. Uh, I was able to get the bright mag one stars we discussed as it got a little darker because it was still actually not quite fully dark when we went out. I was able to see Vega high and a little bit to the north and east and then the summer triangle uh, off to the south and west, which was uh, three bright stars in a big triangle, which is uh, uh, Vega, and then Altair, and Deneb. And then I also was able to, I just could make out Polaris. I think a couple of people actually saw Big Dipper. So good skies, great constellation. You, if you can't see the Big Dipper, you can go ahead and start your sketches uh, tonight. Uh, go out a little bit later, sketch the difference in position. If you simply cannot see the Big Dipper at all, um, uh, you can use a book or an online application to sketch the motion. Uh, I gave you a website where you can actually rotate it around uh, or you can do it with your star map. But the Big Dipper rotates around the North Star in a circle. So that's how that works. Uh, Altair, oh yeah, uh, uh, points to Liam. Uh, the Coast saw Jupiter, uh, Liam got Vega and Arcturus. Good, Arcturus is a red giant, beautiful star. Altair and Ontarius. Oh, uh, there's my first Ontarius. You saw the, uh, off to the south in Scorpius, the, the red blinking heart uh, of, of 
Scorpio towards the center of the Milky Way galaxy. Good spotting. Uh, uh, that's Chetan or Cheetan. Uh, Jupiter and Vega for Sarvesh. Good job. The uh, if you want to do your sketches of the position of Jupiter, since the moon isn't going to be up at night, go ahead and uh, get your initial position uh, on your sketch. That's good spotting. Uh, I think there's a chance, like in, in the next minute, we're going to be switching over to Spencer Suhu, who is uh, helping us. He is a member of the Astronomical Society like I am, but he lives uh, up in a little bit darker spot and he has a beautiful telescope. And uh, we're going to do some live viewing. Okay. Uh, are you there, Spencer? Yeah. Okay, we'll wait for, uh, we'll wait for Spencer a second. Can you hear me, Spencer? You there, Spencer? Thanks, Spencer. Is having technical difficulties. Okay. All right. Uh, oh, there he is. is. Okay. I, uh, I, I introduced you as a member of the Astronomical Society with the telescope, but I haven't told them anything else about what they'll be seeing. Okay. Well, um, a film. They now digitally record the data into computers, and they can analyze it. So there's an aspect of astronomy that is very involved with computers these days. The very best astronomy. You know, the Hubble has a digital camera in it. It gathers the digital images, transmits them down to Earth, where we can turn them into the beautiful pictures and the type of research that an astronomer would do. Uh, so uh, does anyone else have an idea about uh, astronomy-related careers? I can give you another one if you want. How does all of the modern t telecommunications systems work? How do we get all those signals uh, for the internet and phone and telecom all around the earth? Is it all by cable? No. How do we get telecom signals from here to Asia? Satellites. I'm yeah. Satellites, there you go. Uh, Sarvesh had a good answer, climatologist. I like that one a lot. And uh, satellites, that was the one I was thinking of. A lot of companies, big companies, uh, are hiring people that know uh, how to compute orbits because of satellites. If you think about it, you have to be good at astrophysics or you can't possibly launch and uh, maintain a space satellite involved in the telecommunication industry. So uh, I'll list that one and I'll, I'll certainly agree with Sarvesh, a climatologist, if you study the climate of the Earth, having a good knowledge of astrophysics or astronomy is essential. Uh, and actually, they're learning more about the Earth by studying exoplanets, by comparing our solar system to others. And things like, uh, you know, runaway heat and uh, the, the global warming, uh, we're learning things about studying Mars and Jupiter. So planetology, astronomy are very much involved in climatology. So that's a good one. I like that one. Uh, you guys can list any of these in your uh, in your workbook. Astronomer, astrophysicist, climatologist, telecommunication expert. Does anyone else have any ideas? Um, I know you guys know a fair about computers because you're now like virtualized as students here with this COVID thing. Uh, uh, astronomy needs both good engineers, physical engineers. There are jobs just in operating the new giant telescopes. There are mechanics, electricians, uh, engineers, computer experts. Just running one of these observatories requires a staff of highly trained professionals, uh, whether it's keeping the telescope running smoothly, uh, fixing problems, running the computer banks, keeping the electricity going. Uh, these are all good things. So engineering, uh, all, any flavor of engineering you can think that involves uh, astronomy or astrophysics are really good examples. So uh, you can list astronomer, 
telecommunications, climatology, these are all good things. Uh, so you guys can pick whichever one appeals to you. I mean, if you want to type it in the chat, uh, feel free. Uh, what I want to do, want to talk to you about is discuss with your council what courses might be useful for a career. And uh, like I told you, I took an Astronomy 101 class when I was in college, and it really furthered my, my knowledge and my lifelong you know, study of it. Uh, but uh, when I was in high school, you know, really the core of, uh, of astronomy and many other sciences and observing and empirical evidence and hypotheses and all the things that go with science, uh, my mathematics were absolutely fundamental. Um, it was relatively easy for me in high school because I was pretty good at math. I still had to do my homework every night. I hate people that think it's easy. Uh, but when I got to college, it got, it got a lot harder uh, as I got into advanced calculus and differential equations. But those courses helped me immensely in all my other science courses where mathematics are core. So uh, you know, whether it be... So that crazy sound is is probably Spencer moving his telescope, I think. Sorry about that. So, uh, yeah, sorry about that. That's okay, Spencer. I, I just, you know, nothing was happening that was wrong, I think, there. So I think uh, I would list uh, uh, mathematics as courses that would be, you know, fundamental to astronomical related careers, whether they be engineering or academic or uh, mechanical or whatever have you. Uh, yeah, my son is actually an astrophysics major at University of Hawaii. Uh, he grew up with me looking through telescopes and going to observatories, so he's going to college. And you really do have to prepare for a college career for all of these things. You're going to need some kind of science uh, major. And obviously, you have to take the calculus. Two years of calculus. Yeah, two years of calculus, chemistry. Physics, one year chemistry, but not necessarily organic. Physics. Physics. Um, lots of physics before he starts his actual astro classes. Yeah, I mean, yeah. You, you guys aren't necessarily all destined for careers, but, you know, one of the questions I had when I was young is, well, if I wanted to get into something like that, what would I do to prepare myself, you know, in high school and college? So if these things interest you and you have a knack and you're, you're a hard worker, uh, obviously a calculus class, AP calculus, AP physics, AP chemistry, those are all going to be really, uh, um, you know, big uh, uh, preparation for a college career that would lead to these kind of uh, a science and engineering degrees. And uh, who knows, maybe you're going to do something really exciting. I know many of the guys in our club had careers at JPL or NASA or... Uh, Carnegie Institute or Mount Wilson or uh, at one of the telecom contractors out in West LA, aerospace engineers, like all of these guys, even though guys like me and Spencer and some of the other guys in the club, you know, we all went through the same thing you're going through at your age, which is, you know, uh, what do I have to do in school if I wanted to uh, do some of these things? And, you know, if you want to Contact us and, and learn more about it. We're available. You have my email address. Um, you know, it amounts to doing the work and, and preparing yourself uh, for a career and learning a little bit of the history. Uh, the fun of astronomy for me is getting up in the dome and, and looking at things, which hopefully shortly will be have a little bit of live viewing going on. Uh, so uh, three different career opportunities for number nine. Pick the one that interests you and uh, uh, list some of those courseworks that might be valuable in uh, moving into that career. Um, they're not all academic. These mechanical uh, and engineering degrees are a little bit different, so the co coursework's a little bit different from them. But again, the foundational things like uh, calculus and physics are, are core to um, all forms of uh, engineering, so you're not going to get uh, into engineering uh, without those as core, core coursework. So, so how you doing, Spencer? Is uh, is your power yeah. back? Yeah, I'm back, and I'm uh, actually I'm on Jupiter right now. Let me just share the screen. Awesome, that's what we're now, here for. Thank you, Spencer. Jupiter is Jupiter is low on the horizon, so it's kind of murky. So you don't see the uh, you won't see the detail that you would have 
on a telescope, uh, if you're looking directly to a telescope. Hang on a second. Okay, you see the screen? Yep. Oh, look at that. Hey. Okay, now who can pick out the moons? Who can point out the moons? What are the moons there? <laughs> yeah. I, I can see so, them clearly on the screen share. I hope the students can. Yeah. Can you guys see them? Yeah, type in the chat if you see the see the moons of Jupiter. Let's see, we got a vote for Europa and a few yeses. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Okay, great. So Okay, so uh, what's my cursor on? Which one's this one? Ooh. I, even I don't know the answer to that. Uh, you want me to guess? You can you can cheat by actually using your app. Yeah, I could if I had my cell phone Sky, handy. Sky maybe Safari. one of the maybe one of the students is really smart and they can go Google it. Uh, so those uh, moons, the little moons you guys are seeing, like almost every night they change position, and the very first person to ever see the moons of Jupiter was Galileo. Why was Galileo the first person to see the moons of Jupiter? He invented the telescope, so he was the very first person. We call these larger moons of Jupiter the Galilean satellites. And I see it's uh, Io, okay, so, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. So and basically, Callisto, thank you. So I, I, my cursor's on Callisto right now. Callisto. This is uh, Europa. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Ganymede, Europa. Callisto and EO is really right about there. You can barely see it. Oh, it's right. It's like going in front of or behind Jupiter. Yeah. Uh, let me see if I can magnify that. Uh, so you guys, uh, I mean, I know I told you this three times, but this is kind of exciting in a way. This is not pre-recorded pictures. This is a live view of no, Jupiter actually, through Spencer's telescope. Yeah, so it's still pretty low on the horizon. So we're looking through a lot of atmosphere. That's why that's why the image is shimmering so much, mm -hmm. and you're not yeah. seeing much detail. But once, uh, let's see, it's about nine o'clock. If we were to hang out until about midnight, it would be really high up, and then you'd get a really crisp image. Oh yeah, and then like you can see the, you might see the great red spot or the equatorial yeah. bands. Yeah, you can see the banding. Now let me try. You can probably. Uh, I've got a. High, overexposed right now so you can see the moons but let me cut back on the uh exposure level and let's yeah. see if we can't pick out some of the banding in jupiter hang on one second let me just uh yeah shift the screen out of the way here jupiter is so big it, it puts out a lot of light or actually it reflects a lot of light from the sun so spencer's going to change the light settings on his uh laptop that's receiving the image and we may be able to all right, so now the moons are gone, but uh, it's uh, it's not as saturated. Now let's put on the magnifier again. I think we can probably see some banding there. Yeah, not really. Yeah, if you look at it, you horizon. can. Yeah, still too low, but you can kind of see a little bit of banding, maybe going uh, oh left to right, right yeah, about maybe. 10 degrees off the, you know, they're sort of slanted across. Yeah, yeah, I got it, yeah, I got it. Yeah. It's still a little bit wobbly. So what, what Spencer is saying is when things are close to the horizon, they have to pass through way more atmosphere and thicker atmosphere close to the Earth. So objects that are close to the horizon don't appear as clearly in telescopes as things overhead. So, uh, but that's a pretty good view of Jupiter. I'm glad you guys got to see that and the moons of Jupiter in a live view. Um, he's magnifying this image, uh, and you can see as he magnifies it, it makes the picture bigger, but it gets a little blurrier. Um, but you can see that, that wobbling, that's the atmosphere, sure enough. Oops, okay, sorry. so let's, let's go on to a, uh, this is, we'll go on to my favorite double star, Alberio. Oh. Um, A-L-B-I-R-E-O, if you want to look it up and give us some facts about it. Not um, while I'm recording. Oh, okay. <laughs> you can. So a uh, double star, uh, there's two kinds of double stars. And actually, there's triple stars and quadruple stars, too. There's an apparent double where the two stars appear very close together in the sky. But actually, they're really far apart. They're just kind of in a line. That's called an apparent double. 
but an actual double star is a star or two stars that are orbiting each other. And they're called binary stars. And they're actually really common. There's a lot of binary star systems out there. And with a good telescope, you can pick out the two stars separately and they can actually uh, measure how the stars are going around around each other. And that leads to all kinds of calculations about how big they are and it helps us understand them. And, uh, Oh, Krishna had a question. Oh, yeah. Uh, can we see Saturn? Um, uh, Saturn's about half an hour behind Jupiter. Yeah, I don't think we're going to get Saturn through the telescope tonight unless you guys wanted to stay up. Um, Another couple hours? <laughs> well, it'll be up. Uh, you guys can see Saturn uh, before you go to bed if you go out and look you know, to the left of Jupiter a little bit. Um, but here's a double star. Okay, let me crank up the gain just a little bit. So okay, if you were to look at this with your eyes in the night sky, you wouldn't see two stars. You would just see one. Uh, it takes the uh, light gathering and magnification capabilities of this telescope. And look at that. Actually, that's pretty good. We're getting a little bit of atmosphere, but uh, mm -hmm. you see how different sizes and different colors they are? That's really important <laughs> to understanding these two. So I, I'll get it wrong, but one is burning hydrogen, the other is burning helium. Yeah, I think I, uh, Tim taught us that last time and I mixed up. So yeah. Chetan asked a question. Uh, is it possible to see the asteroid belt? So the asteroid belt, you can't see the belt itself because the asteroids are like throwing buckets of grains of sand in the sky. They're far, they're greatly separated. The largest asteroid is Ceres. And I don't think it's up right now, but you can see it in a telescope. Smaller asteroids are much harder to see, but you can see them with a telescope, but you have to track them down one at a time. You're never gonna see like a Star Wars asteroid field where they're close together. That's just totally unrealistic. Well, when you see this asteroids like that, it's because they're flying through it. So yeah, you might see it then. But yeah, but they're, the, yeah. you need the light. There, there's tens of thousands of asteroids from little pebbles all the way up to, you know, a giant uh, of rocks uh, miles and across. But the, the asteroid belt is out beyond Mars, and it's so vast that, you know, no two asteroids are, you know, more than 10,000 miles close to each other. There's just, it's like sand spread out in space, and it's just great vast distances. But every now and then, little things in the asteroid whack into each other. Um, and every now and then, you know, asteroid might get spun down into an Earth grazing orbit or go around the sun. Uh, if you subscribe to Sky and Telescope, you can keep track of that stuff. And uh, a lot of amateur astronomers have made a name in tracking down new asteroids. And it takes some patience and uh, a pretty good telescope. But if you know where to look, and you take pictures on different nights, and you go back and compare those pictures, the stars will stay exactly where they are, but the asteroids will move. That's the thing, asteroids move like planets. Uh, so finding an asteroid, uh, it, and it moves in a certain way. Comets, there's a comet right now, I don't know if you guys know this, there's a comet you can Neowise. see. Neowise. Neowise, yeah. Uh, I think it's gonna be in the evening starting tomorrow in the southern sky, 18th, western sky. Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, nor northwest, northwest. Northwest. Yeah. Uh, it's really close to the horizon at sundown, starting in the next night or two. And you need a pair of binoculars. You can see it with your naked eye, but binoculars will make it show up. It has a nice tail. I've seen it. I saw it on the other side uh, in the morning. But uh, seeing comets is you don't get many chances in your life to see a good comet. So uh, comets actually come from further out. Comets come from beyond the... Uh, the, the orbit of Saturn, they come way out from the icy belt. So there's two belts. There's the asteroid belt of rocky stones between Mars and Jupiter. And then there's the Kuiper belt of frozen ice balls out beyond Saturn and Neptune. And the comets, uh, they come falling in slowly from the Kuiper belt beyond Saturn. And uh, uh, they whip around the sun, and the sun heats them up, and then they have the beautiful tails from the uh, gas that's getting pushed out. So uh, comets are pretty amazing objects, and they're just now really learning about it with our recent, uh, uh, you know, missions out to uh, Pluto and stuff.
Um, so okay. uh, we, you know, uh, on that two star planet where they're different colors, uh, Spencer mentioned, you know, one is burning hydrogen and one is burning helium. I mean, they don't burn things like a campfire burns wood. They burn things by fusion and it takes a, uh, a lot more gravity and pressure in a bigger star to push helium into carbon. Uh, so it has a different color because different elements mean different color. So that's, that's how that works. Um, oh, beautiful nebula. I think it's the yeah. dumbbell, is, right? Dumbbell, yeah. Look at that field <laughs> of stars. You must be pointed higher up in the sky. Yeah, point higher up the sky, but I have uh, some marine layers moving in, so it's getting a little, a little foggy, <laughs> mm. but but uh, I think we'll be okay for the, for tonight. But the uh, humidity is uh, humidity is about sixty two percent, sixty three percent. But uh, temperatures drop, yeah. and I but I can s definitely see some low clouds moving in. So we're shooting. That's why you're seeing a lot of the speckles. Mm. That's uh, that's basically you know, just uh, noise. Uh, I've got a, the gain turned up really high to see this. So. Uh, as you can tell, so this is called M27, so uh, or Messier 27. It's also called the Dumbbell Nebula or the Applecore Nebula. And the story is that these are, so there are a bunch of objects called Messier objects, and they would go from number one through about 110, something like that. And so Charles Messier was looking for comets, and he kept finding these other fuzzy things in the sky which were not comets, so he actually started numbering them so he would avoid looking at them. So, but then uh, a lot of astronomers, amateur astronomers, um, have what they call Messier marathons. So in the spring, you can see it, probably as many as you can, can ever. And so the whole idea is to uh, have a marathon and see how many of these you can track in one night, starting from sunset to sunrise. So this is, um, you can sort of see um, the outline right here. So it's actually a star that is dying. And so as the stars die, it's sort of like the size of our sun. They shrink and, and expand. So they shrink and expand. And so as they do that, the uh, parts of the atmosphere stay out. And so um, what you're seeing is the, uh, the blue is basically oxygen that's being uh, uh, ionized by the uh, radiation from the star. And you can barely see it, but there's tinges of pink around here which uh, are the ionized hydrogen. And so for astrophotographers, this is kind of considered a crappy image because it's so noisy, but the way you, you uh, actually get the images that people, uh, hang on, my neighbor's backing out. Yeah, he'll clear my telescope. <laughs> yeah, don't hit the telescope. <laughs> yeah. Uh, hang on, let's see. So the Dumbbell oh. Nebula, it, it actually, the Apple Core Nebula, it, it's actually blowing material out in two directions, right? Right. Uh, On this yeah. image to the left and right. Yeah. Uh, after we switch, I have I have one that I can I can share with you guys. Uh, mm. uh, but what the, what astrophotographers do is they actually will take about maybe forty or fifty of these images and stack them together. So you superimpose them on top of each other, and as you do that, the, a lot of the noise goes away. And uh, let me find a picture of one that I have. Show you. Okay, yeah, this is it. Uh, okay, are you? Do you see the screen? Uh, we still see your telescope. Okay. All right. Hang on one second. Let me stop the share and share this one. Yeah. Okay. Now let me share. And uh, okay. You there see that is. one now? That's a great image. Yeah. So, so is um, that is the is the star right in the center the the culprit? I think it is, but I'm not absolutely certain. It looks like it. Yeah. So, but there yeah, is. as as Greg mentioned, there are two uh, bubbles of gas, so to speak, and so once they're going opposite directions, and so that's why you get the. Uh, the uh, apple core or the dumbbell shape here. And that's that's inside our Milky Way galaxy, right? Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, now let me go to another uh, deep sky object that's called the Ring Nebula. 
Hang on. Let's see. What's the ring? Ring is M uh, 30. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to think. remember the Messier numbers. M oh, yeah. I, I, 30, M35, I think, is what it is. Uh, let's see. Oh, 57, M57. Yes, that's the ring nebula. Okay, here we go. So a nebula, it means something blurry in the night sky that's not a star. Uh, and it turns out there's various kinds of nebula. Uh, the ones we're looking at are, uh, they are uh, gas clouds and exploding stars and, and birthplace star nurseries. They're pretty interesting objects that are they're being studied a lot these days to try and figure it out. But some of the nebulos, the little ones, are uh, they're little blurry patches that uh, turned out to be galaxies, bar spiral galaxies. And those are not in our Milky Way. They're very far away. All right, we're back to your telescope. OK, and right, back things, to the telescope. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, I was just going to explain that uh, for, for astronomers that were first using good telescopes, one of the amazing things, you know, if you go back a thousand years, they had cataloged like 1,200 stars. And the, the bigger telescopes they built, they just saw more and more and more stars. Like no one could comprehend how many stars there were until, you know, they started uh, mapping out the Milky Way. And then it turns out uh, that there's whole uh, galaxies of stars even further away. It's, it's just mind boggling. And so when I point my telescope at the sky, um, you know, I just see stars and stars. So I, I actually have a sky atlas I use when I'm navigating around. I use, you know, I, I star hop from star to star trying to find what I'm looking for. Okay, so this is the ring nebula. So same idea as the, uh, d uh, as the dumbbell, except there's just one, one sphere of gas that you can see. Uh, this is, uh, let me, let's shoot one more, but uh, make it slightly lower. This is a little overexposed, so let's just try half the time. So this is gonna be another nebula, right? Yeah, uh, right, uh, yeah. Ring nebula. Okay. Now it's really hard to make out, but there is a dwarf star right here. It's about one pixel. That's uh, yeah. the, that's the that's the dwarf that that's for the ring nebula. Let me pull pull the magnifier up here. Okay, so again, this is a kind of a crappy image because we're actually looking through some. Uh, some, through some haze right now and so that doesn't help uh, but um, and like I said I've got the green cranked up so normally if I were doing uh, taking some serious astrophotography I would basically lower the uh, this gain so right now I've got it set for ISO uh, 27,000 or something like that really high I would drop it down to about ISO 400 and this one was an eight second image. I would take a three to five minute image. And so by doing that, a lot of the this noise here is just gone. You just don't get that noise because you get the noise when you're just cranking up the gain. On the, it's like, you know, like on a radio or, or um, a stereo system, if you crank up the volume a lot on, during a, a, a period that where the music is really low, you hear a lot of static. Well, this is the same, this is the equivalent of me cranking up the gain where there's very, very little signal, that, so to speak. The great fuzziness between the stars is kind of just yeah. noise from the sky because right. you're, yeah. Yeah, well, it's partly noise from the sky, but it's also noise from the camera itself. Mm. Uh, you know, it's got thermal noise in the camera. So if I were able to cool the sensor down to 40 degrees below zero, then that would, a lot of it would be gone. But, uh, but it's random, because it's random noise, if you take a lot of pictures, the noise it doesn't always appear in the same place, so it averages out. So this is so another one of these uh, stars that's kind of 
blowing off layers of gas and lighting up the, that gas with energy, like shining a flashlight in fog, kind of. Exactly. This is, this is uh, this actual system, and you can see that the nebula is a tiny object in the sky, but it's much larger than the point of a single star. It's a little cloud that we can see. And astronomers spent a lot of time trying to figure out what would cause a star to do this. Um, up until the last 25 years, they didn't really have a theory for what would form uh, a round ring of clouds and, you know, like this. But now they have pretty good theory. They're, what they're getting into now, you know, is trying to figure out the stuff you know, in other galaxies and how galaxies move around. But um, some of the images in getting is so good, they're actually talking about direct imaging of planets around nearby stars. Uh, I think they found over a thousand planets in nearby stars at this point, mostly by measuring, you know, how the planets wobble the star and, the, and wobble the starlight. But uh, with the new really, really big telescopes they're building, uh, they think it may be possible to image planets passing across the face of distant stars, which is the cutting edge of technology and astronomy. And actually, when that light passes, like think of a planet uh, on an adjacent star, a nearby star to the sun, a planet passes in front of that star, a little bit of the light is going to pass through the edge of the planet. And if that planet has an atmosphere, they may be able to measure the content of that atmosphere and figure out, well, what elements are in that atmosphere. And the people that are studying uh, exobiology are really interested to see that because there's markers in the atmosphere uh, for life. So this is one of the directions that research is going to determine if there might be life on other planets. I mean, uh, the nearest stars are light years away and we don't have the technology to reach those systems even with our most advanced spacecraft. But uh, with these really new big telescopes they're building, there is hope that they may be able to do some direct imaging that may uh, you know, shed some evidence one way or the other on what are on these uh, planets around other stars. Pretty amazing research. So is that, is that an image that you took of the yeah. Ring Nebula? Yeah, yeah. So this is 15 10 second exposures. And so you can actually see this, you can see the, uh, the, the dwarf star in the center. Right there. Are you still there? I think I lost you. Uh, I muted for a second. Yeah. Oh, oh okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. So okay. sliding that central star is it really, that's actually kind of tough, even in, in a good telescope. Yeah. Uh, so, and and that, uh, that's the star that's blowing up and pushing that ring of gas out, right? Right, yeah. yeah. It's a bubble of gas, and so because we're looking at head-on, so to speak, it looks like a ring, a donut. And so now, you, now when you actually get a chance to look through a real telescope, you'll be, you'll be disappointed because um, you know, when I tell people, when they look through the telescope on the Green Nebula, look for a little gray donut, a little puff of smoke. Right, and because you'll ne you'll never see the color with your eyes, yeah. so your your eyes uh, have a great deal of dynamic range, so you can actually make up a lot more detail than the camera can see. So this is 15, 10 second exposures. With your eye, you can take that in and you can see the ring right away, but the camera takes 10 seconds to get to one image, or like you saw, and it's kind of fuzzy at that, but. Yeah, you know, so your the camera has less sensitivity in your eyes, but it picks up color. Your eye uh, doesn't pick up the color because you're using night vision. You don't see any colors with night vision, but you have a lot, a lot more sensitivity, and so that's that's a trade-off. Okay, so I think I have a request for a last object nearby. Uh, okay. Before we call our viewing session over and see if anyone has any questions about their packets, I think the constellation Hercules is nearby. Uh, yeah, let me see. Okay, that might be too far overhead. Oh, yeah, it's uh, like, it's not far yeah. from where you are, but it is a little more overhead. Yeah, unfortunately, I, because, because I had a, it's a, Murphy's Law kicked in, so I'm not using the telescope I normally use. So mm -hmm. this one has a, um, a fork mount, and so I can't get it that high up with the camera. Oh, right. But, cause... but Jupiter, uh, Saturn is out now. Well, I'm sure the students so, would love to see that. Oh, yeah. Okay. All right, so we'll head for Saturn. 
That's going to be low on the horizon, but we should be able to see the rings. Mm -hmm. Okay, first of all, okay, yeah, okay, here we go, Saturn. Okay, stop sharing. Go to my view. Okay. Now let's get it a little better in focus. It's a little out of focus right now. Yeah, it's not gonna. Yeah, it's uh, still pretty low on the horizon. Yeah. Well, that's uh, <laughs> when Galileo first saw Saturn. He thought it was a planet with with uh, with earlobes. <laughs> Uh, that's, well, okay. Let me crank up the gain, at least see if we can't see some of those moons. Yeah, we're up uh, as high as, it, okay, it's as magnified as it's gonna get. And, uh, yeah, that's kind of disappointing right now. Another well, you wanna, you 15 can you point minutes. You just to see what we can see? Pardon? Can we get the live view? Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I thought I was on live view. Sorry about that. That's okay. Okay, hang on just a second. I'm chattering while I'm thinking I'm on live view. <laughs> yeah, so Spencer has been helping the club work on our first virtual star parties where guys with telescopes get together and, and do this viewing sharing what they can see from their various telescopes. So normally we get together as a club and we do this up in the mountains and have actual star parties. Uh, okay, but now you we're now? getting. Oh yeah, I see it. Yeah, it's it's kind of oval. The the lobes aren't very clear. Right. And let me pull the magnifier in. Yeah, it's still pretty pretty fuzzy. Yeah, it'll get clearer as it rises. But yeah, that's yeah. a that oval shape is the rings, and the actual planet is in the center of that oval disk. But until it rises up and and gets clearer, we're not going to be able to separate the rings from the planet. So yeah, you can. There's a gap in the rings called the Cassini division, and so if seeing is really good. You can pick out that. Like yeah. a division, no problem. Okay, shall we swing back over to Jupiter for one last shot at Jupiter and then? Sure, it's a little clear. higher. It might be a little clearer. Yeah, uh-huh. Oh, yeah. Ah, you can see EO just coming right around the... Yeah, I see it already. Okay. Yeah, there's EO right there. Ah, look at that. So you think it's coming from behind or from going in front? One or the other? I, th I think it's coming from behind. I'm not sure. But that is cool. That so is you cool. notice when we first started looking at it, what, about uh, half an hour ago? Yeah. You could barely see it. Now it's, it's definitely come out. That's cool. Yeah. And so it was uh, 400 years ago, 
Galileo mapped the motion of these moons in his notebook, and he realized that Jupiter has moons like the Earth, and that reasoning led to, well, maybe the Earth is not the center of the solar system, you know, uh, and he was the very first one to propose that, you know, other planets could have moons, and so that, that Jupiter was a planet, you know, like the Earth, not something different. I'm still not really seeing the bands. Yeah, I'm trying to crank down. Let me crank down this just a little bit more. No, I can't, still can't make out the bands. Yeah. We were up at Ford Observatory, was it last weekend? I went up Saturday night, and we got a really, really nice look of Jupiter. The red spot with the swirly stuff around it but that was a little bit higher up and we were on the 18 inch with our eyeballs. So still, this is good. Yeah. Okay, let's see. Anything else we got here? Let's see. No, we really, really appreciate you uh, sharing your telescope. If anything, Spencer, uh, uh, do you still have the setup where you could show us your telescope uh, from a different view? Uh, yeah, I probably can. Uh, let me, I probably, uh, sh I'll have to shine a flashlight on it. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> yeah, I don't uh, want to mess you up, but like, no, no, I'm amazing views of the skies. I thought the scouts might want to see, you know, what kind of setup <clears throat> you show us this stuff. Oh, okay. All right. So I'll hang on. Let me grab a flashlight yeah, yeah, and a turn second. to so in, in our last 10 minutes here, we're going to have Spencer show you a little bit about his telescope. But uh, I want to give you guys a chance to type in the chat if you have any questions. Uh, hopefully, you got all the notes you need and your merit badge booklet. I will email everyone uh, a copy of the slide deck or put them on a Google box or something uh, so you can download those to help with your notes. If our, if our YouTube thing works, uh, you'll have a link to that. You can come back and watch a section where we went over one of the numbers. Remember, you do have to do your prerequisites for the moon drawings and the Big Dipper and stuff. Um, but, you know, I really want everyone that uh, joined us tonight to earn the badge. And uh, if you send me a completed packet, I will absolutely make sure you get your blue card and an invitation to spend some time uh, with the club at our observatory. Um, and uh, we'll do some kind of scout night or something uh, once we're open again and it's safe. Um, I really enjoyed sharing uh, my love of astronomy with the scouts and doing star parties at summer camps and uh, here in Los Angeles. So I do thank you for joining. You know, if, you're, if you're uncertain about how do I finish my packet or I didn't find the information I need in the merit badge book or I didn't get notes, uh, feel free to email me or Carolyn. We will be happy to help you. We have two more sessions, one next Wednesday night and then one in August. If you feel like you want to wait and do this again to finish your packet, you're welcome to join. Just email us and let us know. Um, and on your prerequisites, uh, you have a couple of choices. You can either just uh, draw sketches if you have a print of that page from the workbook, or you can just sketch on a piece of paper. Um, you can either take a picture of that with a cell phone, or you can scan it on a flatbed scanner and I email the uh, picture for your prereqs along with the answers for your workbook. So hopefully you won't have too much trouble with that. Uh, and you'll be able to send that in. And, and we'll try to get those blue cards back to you. Like I said at the beginning, we're gonna send you a scan of your blue card that you can print out. If you would like a physically mailed copy to your address, or you would like me to log in to scoutbook.com and register that, email me and I'll do that. But the default is you'll send me the workbook and I'll send you back a, uh, a signed blue card uh, with your name and everything. And you can print that and give it to your scout master. If I can speak. Sure. All right, let me mute. Okay, can let's see. I, I, okay, this is gonna be kind of awkward. Uh, can you see the uh, telescope? Uh, you're still on the line. The line view. There. How's that? 
Uh, I don't think this is gonna this is gonna work too well. I do have a I, I have a picture of the telescope I can share with people. Okay. Hang on, just a second. Let me pull that up. Okay, one second here. All right, let me share this one. Okay. Oh, that's so cool. <laughs> All right, so this is an earlier iteration. I've gone through several configurations now. So this is the main, this is a 10 inch Schmidt Cassegrain. This is a guide scope. And this is a finder on top of that. This is a laser pointer. And then that's my eyepiece. And I've got a flip mirror and I've got a camera here. So basically there's a mirror that uh, the light, so the light comes in. Hits a curved mirror at the back, bounces to another mirror that's at the top, and then back to a hole in the back of the uh, of the main, uh, main mirror, and then out to this hole. And so then it hits the mirror, and the mirror directs light up to my eyepiece, or I flip the mirror out of the way and go straight to the camera. So um, so that's uh, that's probably a little overkill because a lot of people who do astrophotography. Uh, don't bother with having that flip mirror system. They're, they're so good at being able to get things lined up that they, they can just find things with the camera right away. And the other thing is that uh, uh, most people who do it will actually spend like days imaging one, eye, one object, you know, so maybe capture four or five hours of an object one night, come back the next night, get four or five objects. So they don't actually hop around a lot like I do. So that's, uh, that's my setup. All right. Oh, this. Oh, this is. Uh, this is for guiding. So, uh, because you know, you get lined up uh, according to the Earth's axis, but you're always going to be off by a little bit, or the mechanic, the gears slip a little bit, and so this actually, this scope has a camera built into it, uh, and so you basically have software that says, okay, you point at a star and you say, move the telescope just to keep that star centered. And so that's how you can get the five minute images without a lot of streaking or, you know, without the stars uh, being elongated or, or bloated. Astronomers used to have to do that by hand with two knobs and they had to keep the star on the crosshairs taking a photograph for hours on end. Yeah. Oh, I remember uh -huh. uh, back in 1984, I had a couple of friends in grad school uh, who were astro um, PhDs at UCLA. Yeah. And we went up to the top of the math science building and they were playing around with a telescope because they're grad students they get to. And uh, it was that magical year where all the planets were lined up. Yeah, so just mm -hmm. like, okay, move it a little bit, a little bit, a little bit and go see one from the other. A lot of fun. Yeah. But uh, yeah, to keep it centered, it was like, okay, hold that, hold that, keep well, turning, keep turning. <laughs> in the 70s, before digital cameras, you had to use film and so you might right. take uh, you might have to be guiding on a on a an object for 10 or 15 minutes by hand and uh so if somebody came along and flashed the white light in, in your face or in your scope you'd be really upset because you just wasted all that time oh, but yeah. now with the digital cameras you, you don't really it's not a big deal mm -hmm. Okay, well, we're reaching okay. our end. Carolyn, you wanted to comment a little bit about the turning in of the worksheets? Yes. Um, okay, so students, the PDF that you were sent is a fillable PDF, right, Greg? I believe so. Be sure and save it if it is. Okay, so the first thing you need to do as a fillable PDF is, all right, I'm going to switch to. And am I talking? I'm talking, but I'm not coming up as a screen. Oh, well. Um, so as a fillable PDF, first thing you do is do a save as and save it onto your computer under another name. Uh, yeah, better if it's under another name. 
and then go ahead and fill it out, save it again, and then save that last, I mean that last save with all your answers in it, send that PDF over to Greg Thompson, um, along with um, any pictures of drawings, which, you know, just use a regular piece of paper, but use like a marker so that it comes out dark. So when you put your phone on it, you can see the um, actual drawing more clearly. Because if you just use a pencil and then you try to use your phone to take a picture, it's not gonna come out very clear. And then send all of those over to Mr. Thompson. He'll look it over and uh, if everything's good, uh, you'll get a blue card in the mail. And the blue card has to be signed by the scout leader. So I can't do that. True, the blue card does have to be signed by the scout leader. And there's, you know, a digital equivalent of doing it in scout book. And if your troop does scout book, you know, uh, let us know and we'll work that out. Uh, but it's always a good idea to have the physical blue card on hand, even if it's just a PDF. Any other questions? Any other questions? Oops, something on chat. I completed the workbook on paper. Can I just take pictures and send it, or does it have to be a PDF? Um, ideally, if you've already finished it, on paper um taking a picture with your phone doesn't give you the best result if you have a flatbed scanner that's better yeah but if the, if the phone comes out okay i'm fine just don't send me like 30 images you know if you can i that's what i like the flatbed scanner but i mean what, if you scan it picture it just give me your answers and i'll go through them when you get your blue phone. Hell. <laughs> So if we wrote it out on paper, it's just better type it on a PDF. Um, your choice. Your choice. It's your choice. So if you already did it on paper, then you know just if you have a flat bid scanner, you can make a PDF of the uh, what you already wrote. Uh, if you don't, you can try just using your phone, and we'll do the best we can. And if we can't read it, you know we'll just they, send you a message. If they want to mail me. A physical piece of paper that's okay uh yeah that's true uh, so, so tell chetton if he wants to mail me his filled out thing to email me and i'll send him the address okay that's another option if you've already done it and you just want to go ahead and mail it um email me yeah email mr thompson let him know um that you want to mail it that you're going to physically mail it and he will I'll Let, send you the address. He will email to you our address. So we have a few more classes after this one. But they're not required. Those are separate No, these are different classes. You've gone through all the requirements. Um, now you still have to fill out the worksheet. Uh, you have the prereqs you have to do and you have to turn in the worksheet. Um, but optionally to come to another class same material yeah the it all the classes are going to have the same material i have gone ahead and posted the recording of the previous meeting um on my youtube channel but it's not complete because it completely missed the star party um we're going to try to do a live stream onto youtube um next week and that would be something you can just you know turn on youtube and catch if there's anything you want to miss or you know it's going to be there so you can catch it whenever you want to or not the other classes are not but you don't have to come to any more classes unless you want to you know tune, tune in next week um around nine o'clock to catch the star party see what else we can bring up <laughs> we'll see uh, especially on the What's, August one, hopefully we can get the comment. Oh, that would be really cool. Yeah, maybe if you want to tune in on August, maybe we can get the comment. I don't know. Maybe we can get it next week. We'll see. Yeah, we'll see. Yeah. Nothing ventured and all that. All right, guys. So fill out your packet. Figure out how you're going to send it to me. 
uh, email me any questions or email Carolyn with any questions. Um, thank you for tuning in tonight on behalf of uh, myself and the Astronomical Society. We are very happy to share our knowledge and our interest in this science with all of you. Um, it's a good badge. Congratulations. I'll look forward to getting your packets. I'm gonna, uh, we're gonna stick around for about 10 more minutes just in case you wanted to type in any questions or go out and look at the stars and come back. But uh, for the bulk of you, I think we're done. Yeah, and I'm gonna stop the recording. Okay, thanks everyone.